Welcome to Pediatric Videos for PedsCases.com. Hello, my name is Katie Gergulis, and I'm a medical student at the University of Alberta. This podcast was developed with the help of Dr. Andrew Mackey and Dr. Karen Forbes. Dr. Mackey is a pediatric cardiologist at the Stollery Children's Hospital, and Dr. Forbes is a pediatrician and medical educator at the Stollery Children's Hospital. This podcast is about the cardiac condition, Tetralogy of Fallot. For teaching on the general approach to pediatric heart murmurs, please check out the Evaluation of a Heart Murmur podcast on pedcases.com. By the end of this podcast, the learner will be able to number one, recognize the clinical presentations of Tetralogy of Fallot, number two, describe the four anatomical characteristics of Tetralogy of Fallot, number three, describe the pathophysiology of the murmur in Tetralogy of Fallot, number four, formulate initial steps when Tetralogy of Fallot is suspected, number five, delineate the treatment of hypercyanotic episodes, and number six, summarize the definitive treatment for Tetralogy of Fallot. Let's start with the clinical case. You are working with Dr. Smith, a family physician, during your family medicine rotation. Josh is a four-month-old infant who is here for a well baby check. Dr. Smith encourages you to start the history and physical exam on your own before she joins you in the room. All is going well until you notice a murmur while auscultating John's chest. Oh no, you're struggling to remember cardiology and murmurs. Let's quickly remind ourselves of some key points about heart murmurs. Before getting into details of the case, let's do a brief review of how we distinguish innocent murmurs from pathological ones. A good mnemonic for features of innocent murmurs is the seven S's. Sensitive, short, single, small, soft, sweet, and systolic. I will explain each of these briefly. Sensitive. This means that the murmur changes with position or respiration. Short duration. This means that the murmur is not pan-systolic. Single, this means that there are no clicks or gallops. Small, this means that the murmur is limited to a small area and is non-radiating. Soft, the murmur is of low intensity. Sweet, this means that the murmur is not harsh in quality. And systolic, this means that the murmur is limited to systole. Remember, diastolic and pan-systolic murmurs are always pathological, whereas systolic ejection murmurs may or may not be pathological. In addition to the features of the murmur on auscultation, we need to look for symptoms and signs on history and physical exam, such as the following, that would raise concern for a pathological murmur. These features include respiratory difficulties, cyanosis, poor feeding, poor growth, syncope, family history of congenital heart disease or sudden cardiac death, abnormal vital signs, diminished or absent femoral pulses, diastolic or pansystolic murmur, high-intensity murmur of grade greater than or equal to 3, increased murmur intensity when the child is in an upright position, harsh quality of the murmur, abnormal S2, for example, not physiologically split, and extra heart sounds, such as clicks or gallops. Now, back to the case. Dr. Smith enters the room and asks you for a brief presentation about Josh. From the history, you learn that Josh's parents have no big concerns. However, they've noticed that he seems to turn blue in the lips when crying very hard. These episodes resolve spontaneously, but are occurring every few days. Josh is their fourth child. It was an uncomplicated pregnancy with routine prenatal care. He was born one week later than his due date from an induced vaginal delivery. He breastfeeds every three hours, generally well, but sometimes takes longer time to feed. Josh's parents report that he was a small baby, born at the 10th percentile, but is tracking along his length and weight growth curves. His immunizations are up to date. Thus, the main finding from the history is central cyanosis. Josh's parents describe this as turning blue around the lips. Central cyanosis is concerning, as it suggests that deoxygenated blood is being pumped from the heart into circulation. Somehow, the blood is not getting fully oxygenated in the lungs. Feeding problems in an infant should also raise alarm, particularly if there is a history of prolonged feeding, diaphoresis while feeding, or an infant needing to stop frequently to catch their breath while feeding. These may be indicative of congestive heart failure, with pulmonary overcirculation leading to shortness of breath and tachypnea. 
or it could be associated with lower oxygen saturation of the blood and therefore reduced exercise tolerance. It is useful to think about feeding as an infant's form of exercise. Let's move on to the physical exam. You and Dr. Smith work together to examine Josh and your findings are as follows. Josh is content and well appearing. His vital signs are normal other than a low oxygen saturation of 81%. There is a grade 3 out of 6 harsh systolic crescendo decrescendo murmur heard best along the left sternal border. This murmur radiates to the axilla and back. The examination of all other systems is normal. Altogether, Josh's associated symptoms, so the cyanotic episodes, and abnormal vital signs, the low oxygen saturation, as well as features of the murmur, so this is the harsh quality, high intensity, and large radiation, should point you towards a pathological murmur rather than an innocent murmur. In fact, what has been described is a common presentation of Tetralogy of Fallot. What is Tetralogy of Fallot, you might ask? Tetralogy of Fallot is a cyanotic congenital heart disease that arises due to problems during embryological development as the heart undergoes septation. It involves four anatomical characteristics. Number one is a ventricular septal defect, or a VSD. Number two is pulmonary stenosis. Number three is an overriding aorta. And number four is right ventricular hypertrophy. Next, we should explore why and how these anatomical features occur. Normally, the ventricles are divided by a muscular septum that develops up from the floor of the ventricles and a membranous septum that develops down from the tissue that divides the outflow tract into the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. These two join together to form the ventricular septum. In Tetralogy of Flow, the outflow tract is divided unequally such that the aorta is much larger than the pulmonary tract, leading to features of an overriding aorta and pulmonary stenosis. This shifts the membranous septum so it does not align properly with the muscular septum, creating a ventricular septal defect. These anatomical characteristics create a system wherein the pulmonary circulation has high resistance due to the stenosis, and the systemic circulation has a relatively lower resistance. Remember that blood will follow the path of least resistance. As a result, the VSD allows deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle to shunt directly to the aorta. This is the lower resistance circulation. It is important to note that you do not hear a murmur due to the VSD. The hole is typically very large, allowing pressures in the right ventricle and the left ventricle to nearly equalize. Moreover, there is not a large pressure gradient driving flow across the VSD, which would cause an audible murmur. Instead, the murmur is due to the pulmonary stenosis. As blood is ejected through the narrow pulmonary tract during systole, a murmur is audible due to the turbulent flow. If the obstruction becomes more severe, the murmur actually becomes quieter because more blood shunts across the VSD. Lastly, the right ventricular hypertrophy is not present at birth. It develops over time as the right ventricle is exposed to systemic pressures due to the VSD. Let's review what we would expect on history and physical exam for an infant with Tetralogy of Fallot. Tetralogy of Fallot is often diagnosed prenatally, however, when it is not, it commonly presents within the first few months of life as a systolic murmur with or without associated hypercyanotic spells, also called TET spells, and low oxygen saturation, just like Josh. The TET spells can occur when there is increased right ventricular outflow tract obstruction or pulmonary vascular resistance, or when there is decreased systemic vascular resistance. These promote more shunting from the right ventricle to the left ventricle, causing more mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood which is then pumped out into the systemic circulation and leads to cyanosis. Uncommonly, children with Tetralogy of Fallot can present with signs and symptoms of congestive heart failure if there is very minimal outflow obstruction and thus left to right shunting across the VSD, leading to pulmonary overcirculation. Symptoms and signs such as respiratory difficulties, difficulty feeding, failure to thrive, tachycardia, tachypnea, and hepatomegaly are suggestive of congestive heart failure. These patients are often referred to as pink tets as they do not experience significant cyanosis. Overall, your approach for Tetralogy Fallot is the same as that for any other pediatric heart murmur. Through the history and physical exam, you should be looking for any features that are concerning for a pathological murmur. If you suspect congenital heart disease, you should try to classify the clinical presentation into one of three categories, cyanotic, congestive heart failure, or low cardiac output. Cyanotic suggests a right-to-left shunt. Congestive heart failure 
suggests a left to right shunt, and low cardiac output suggests an obstructive lesion. Tetralogy of Fallot fits into the cyanotic category. Let's think about Josh again. We have established that his clinical presentation is highly suspicious for Tetralogy of Fallot, but what should we do now? What are the next steps? Regardless of the underlying diagnosis, suspected cyanotic congenital heart disease or concerns regarding a pathological murmur require prompt evaluation by pediatric cardiology and evaluation with an echocardiogram or an echo. An echo allows for identification of the cardinal features of tetralogy of Fallot, including the degree of obstruction of the right ventricular outflow tract. ECGs are valuable tools in assessment of congenital heart disease, but are not sufficient alone for diagnosis. Please note, a chest x-ray does not need to be performed for children with a murmur unless there is respiratory distress, as it is neither sensitive nor specific. So what happened to Josh? As we previously mentioned, you and Dr. Smith agreed that Josh had concerning features for a pathological murmur. Thus, you help write a referral to pediatric cardiology at the Stollery Children's Hospital. Josh's parents book an appointment in two weeks. In the meantime, you send Josh for an ECG. When the results become available, you and Dr. Smith sit down in her office to take a look. The ECG shows right axis deviation and right ventricular hypertrophy. A week later, the clinic receives a letter from the pediatric cardiologist. Josh underwent an echo, which confirmed the diagnosis of tetralogy of Fallot. Let's move on to management. Now that the diagnosis of tetralogy of Fallot has been confirmed, Josh's parents have a lot of questions. They want to know about the long-term treatment of his tetralogy of flow, but first, they want to know what they should do when Josh turns blue. The management for TET spells can be divided into two categories, supportive measures performed by the parent or guardian, and medical interventions provided by a physician. So let's start with the supportive measures that can be provided by the parent or caregiver. Number one, place the child in a knees to chest position. This increases systemic resistance, reducing the right to left shunting. Number two, have the caregiver hold the child. This prevents further agitation and may help him or her calm down. Next are the medical interventions. Number one is to supply oxygen. This is important because low oxygen saturation is what's causing the cyanosis. Number two, morphine can help calm the child and also reduce pulmonary vascular resistance. Number three, phenylephrine, an alpha-1 adrenergic receptor agonist, is sometimes used in the hospital setting in order to increase systemic vascular resistance, therefore promoting blood flow through the pulmonary tract to the lungs for oxygenation. In terms of the long-term management of Tetralogy of Fallot, we need to consider surgical repair and endocarditis prophylaxis. Let's briefly discuss each one of these. First, Surgical repair usually takes place within a few months of the diagnosis. This is the definitive treatment. It involves closing the VSD and enlarging the right ventricular outflow tract. The procedure may be valve sparing if the stenosis is mild to moderate, but in cases of moderate or severe stenosis, surgical management may affect the pulmonary valve and result in regurgitation postoperatively. These children will often need a pulmonary valve replacement later in life. Second, Josh will require infective endocarditis prophylaxis before dental, surgical, or other invasive procedures, as his tetralogy of flow and surgical repair puts him at risk for bacteria adhering to his cardiac endothelium. According to the American Heart Association and Canadian Dental Association, infective endocarditis prophylaxis is required for patients with A. Prosthetic valve or material B. History of infective endocarditis or C, specific types of congenital heart disease. These include unrepaired or incompletely repaired cyanotic congenital heart disease, completely repaired congenital heart defect with prosthetic material or device during the first six months after the procedure, or any repaired congenital heart defect with residual defect at the site or adjacent to the site of a prosthetic patch or a prosthetic device. Thus, children with tetralogy of Fallot require infective endocarditis prophylaxis preoperatively and for at least the first six months postoperatively. In some cases, the prophylaxis is required lifelong. Let's conclude with our case. You are back with Dr. Smith for a family medicine rotation and are excited to see that Josh is coming in for his one-year checkup. Josh's tetralogy of Fallot was successfully repaired at six months of age. 
He's no longer having hypercyanotic cat spells. He's growing well and meeting all of his developmental milestones. Josh's parents hand you a letter from their most recent appointment with the pediatric cardiologist, which states that Josh is doing very well from their perspective. The cardiologist recommends stopping the endocarditis prophylaxis six months post-surgery. Josh's parents are very impressed with your clinical skills and wish you all the best in your future career. Thank you for listening to the podcast. I hope you now have a better understanding of Tetralogy of Fallot. You should be able to 1. Recognize the clinical presentations of Tetralogy of Fallot. 2. Describe the four anatomical characteristics of Tetralogy of Fallot. 3. Describe the pathophysiology of the murmur in Tetralogy of Fallot. 4. Formulate initial steps when Tetralogy of Fallot is suspected. 5. Delineate the treatment of hypersynodic episodes. 6. Summarize the definitive treatment for Tetralogy of Fallot. Next, Check out the companion case about Tetralogy of Fallot on pedscases.com. Here you can test your knowledge by working through the case and answering practice questions. This concludes the podcast on Tetralogy of Fallot. Check out www.pedscases.com for more great podcasts, videos, interactive cases, questions, and more. Press subscribe on iTunes to get access to all of our podcasts. If you like what we do, please leave a review on the iTunes store, share with your friends and colleagues, or think about getting involved.